right now in the time between the advents, between the Lord's first coming as a baby and his second coming as judge, is a time that is rich with divine patience. Opportunities to repent and, and believe are everywhere. Opportunities to love and serve are everywhere. Opportunities to begin the healing process are everywhere. Today, after church, you can pick up the phone and call that family member and you can say you're sorry and that you want to be reconciled with her. Today, that can happen. Today, after the service, you can call the therapist or the counselor or the friend or the family member and say, help me, I'm stuck. Right now, we live, again, between the advents and in this time period, we're so blessed because God's patience is overflowing. There is one historical Christian belief that we mainline Protestants are the most likely to get embarrassed about. It's the idea of, of Jesus' second coming. Uh, frankly, I, I think it makes a lot of uh, Anglicans blush. It conjures up images of self-proclaimed prophets stapling photocopied posters to telephone poles announcing that the end of the world is coming, say, for example, on May 27, 2012. But I think it's plain to see that belief in the Lord's literal return, his second coming, lies undeniably at the heart of our faith. And I think you know this because you all proclaim it every Sunday morning when you stand up with me and all together we recite the words of the Nicene Creed. In fact, in a few minutes, you are going to be saying it with me, proclaiming your faith that, and I quote, Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. So again, this, this, this teaching is a core piece of Christian doctrine and I think that it's one that's particularly emphasized in the season that we're all in right now, which is, of course, the season of Advent. Advent, after all, is a Latin-based word, and it means coming. And during the season of Advent, we remember not only the Lord's first coming as a little baby born to a Jewish peasant girl 2,000 years ago, but we look forward to his imminent second coming as well. So, the question listen carefully, that I want to wrestle with today is this. Given the fact that Christ will come again, how ought we to live our lives now? Right? Say that again. Given the fact that Christ will come again, how ought we to live our lives now? And I'm going to answer that question by taking a deeper look at that, that passage from Second Peter that was, uh, that was read earlier. Before I dive, though, into that scriptural reading, um, to explore that question, I want to revisit that line from the Nicene Creed that I quoted just a few minutes ago. And the line, as you recall, is this. Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. So the, teach, the church teaches not only that Christ will come again, but that when he does come again, he will come as a kind of judge. And I think the New Testament has a, a bunch of different ways of describing that particular time of judgment. For example, a couple weeks ago, I preached on the parable of the sheep and the goats. That was on Christ the King Sunday. And in that, in that teaching of Jesus, the final judgment is described as a kind of sorting out, with all humanity being divided into two groups. On the one hand, you have the blessed, and then on the other hand, you have the cursed. On the one hand, you have the sheep, and the other hand, the goats. The author of 2 Peter, though, speaks of this judgment in different terms. He describes the judgment as being a time of disclosure. And I find that really fascinating. Listen to what he, he writes. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the earth and everything on it will be disclosed. And the Greek word that's translated here in the NRSV as disclosed can also be translated found out or discovered. In fact, there are other English translations where I think those actual words are used. And I get the impression here that Christ's great judgment will involve an unveiling of things. It will involve an uncovering of everything that, that's now being done in secret. This great moment when the curtain of secrecy that so many wicked people rely upon to go about doing their wickedness finally comes down and then we'll be able to see all that's been going on, perhaps, you know, secretly unbeknownst to us. And I think even right now in the fallen world that we live in, we see little miniature 
um, versions of this ultimate uncovering which will one day happen, right? Uh, let's take a, a, an, an example kind of from the tabloids, um, but also in the mainstream press as well. Something that many of you have followed perhaps over the years is the whole scandal involving Jeffrey Epstein, right? You've got this once very respected billionaire philanthropist, but then what we learn through the testimony of several courageous victims is that, you know, he wasn't much of a humanitarian at all. He was secretly a serial predator, and he was using his wealth to just prey upon dozens and dozens of vulnerable girls. Okay, so that's an example of even before the final judgment of evil being unveiled, revealed to us. Another interesting historical example. What happened in 1945 when Germany surrendered and the war in Europe finally came to an end? Well, the Allies actually gathered together German civilians, if you remember your history, and took them on tours of the now liberated concentration camps, showing them the gas chambers, showing them the ovens, showing them the mass graves, just basically unveiling the evil that was unfolding in quasi-secrecy behind all those brick walls and barbed wire fences in, in Germany and Poland and countries like that, right? So again, according to the New Testament hope, that's the fate that awaits the entire cosmos one day. The day will come when there will be an un, a decisive unveiling of things, a day when all that is wicked and hateful and cruel and unjust will be dragged out of the darkness and then brought into the searing light of God's judgment. Jesus himself said, all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and be made known to all. On that day, every secret prison camp of every dictator will be exposed and shut down. The contents of every hard drive of every corrupt politician made public for everyone to see. Every door on every house of every child abuser thrown open and the horrible misdeeds that once took place in secret will be revealed and condemned utterly. On that day, evil will no longer have a place to hide. This, according to the author of Second Peter, is how the final judgment works. Last week in her sermon, Jasmine mentioned C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And not to be undone, I'm going to reference that book as well. There's this beautiful scene in the book towards the end um, where the Christ figure of the story, the noble lion Aslan, manages to lead his followers into the castle of the now defeated witch. And once they manage to take over the enemy's stronghold, the first thing Aslan and his people do is start opening the place up. And I'm going to read from the book right now. C.S. Lewis writes, and into the interior they all rushed, and for several minutes the whole of that dark, horrible, fusty old castle echoed with the opening of windows and with everyone's voices crying out at once. Don't forget the dungeons. Give us a hand with this door. Here's another little winding stairs. Phew, how it smells here. At last the ransacking of the witch's fortress was ended. The whole castle stood empty with every door and window open, and the light and the sweet spring air flooding in all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. I love that quote. The light and the sweet spring air flooding in all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. That's what awaits us on the other side of Christ's judgment. A renewed world, cleansed, and good and whole and right. And the author of Second Peter speaks of this renewed world when he writes, and I quote, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. I love that phrase too, where righteousness is at home. I think righteousness is present in the fallen world that we live in right now, and look around you, right? From time to time, you'll see acts of kindness. From time to time, you'll see these noble acts of mercy. From time to time, you'll see genuine Christ-like acts of self-sacrificial love. You'll, you'll see it. But if, but if you're anything like me, you'll notice sometimes with a kind of heartache that such goodness is kind of unusual, right? It's sort of out of place in the world that we live in now. But that's not the case in what Peter calls the new heavens and the new earth. Here, righteousness is actually at home. 
Our Jewish, Jewish neighbors referred to this as olam haba, or the world to come. And Jesus referred to it as the kingdom of God. So to recap, our faith affirms, number one, Jesus will return in glory. Two, he will come as judge. And three, that he will usher in his eternal kingdom. And it all starts with that second coming. That's why that second coming, that teaching, that doctrine is so vitally important for us to believe and confess. So here's where we get back to the question that I started with originally. Okay? Given the fact that Jesus will one day return to judge the world and usher in the kingdom, how ought we to live our lives now? And here's the answer. According to 2 Peter, we are to be, and I quote, leading lives of holiness and godliness. Right? Leading lives of holiness and godliness. Now, when I hear that phrase, holiness and godliness, I'm tempted to, you know, to think it just means going to church and staying out of trouble which is relatively easy to do. At least the going to church part. Staying out of trouble is a bit harder. It's so much more than that, though. I'll put it this way. If you want to live a life of holiness and godliness, here's what you've got to do. Live your life as if you already live in a world where righteousness is at home. In other words, live by the values of the kingdom of God here and now. How do you do that, you might be asking. Well, you do so by imitating the king himself, Jesus. That means abstaining from hatred and vengeance and the self-righteous judgment of others. Abstaining from fornication and adultery, giving away your wealth, loving your enemies, praying for your persecutors, practicing mercy, practicing forgiveness, ministering to the needy, which means feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the strangers, serving your brothers and sisters in Christ, practicing self-sacrificial love, confessing in word and in deed that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. That's what it means to live a life of holiness and godliness. It means to live a life that, that you don't mind Christ unveiling and revealing on the final day of judgment, a life that you're not ashamed of. Now, it, it, it could be that as you're hearing all of this, you're thinking to yourself, uh, my life looks nothing like this right now. Or you may be thinking, I'm not that bad, but I'm, I, I think I'm still really falling short. My, my commitment to Jesus is kind of lukewarm at best. And we've all had moments where we think that. Believe me, I have too. And if that's the case, there's good news in this passage of Scripture. There's enormous comfort that we can take from this passage of Scripture. But also there comes a, a very serious um, warning. But we'll start with the, the good news and the comforting message first. The good news is this, it's not too late. I'll explain. The author of 2 Peter is writing this letter to address the doubts that many Christians of the time had about Jesus' second coming. A lot of them were saying to themselves, boy, it's been a couple of generations since the Lord Jesus ascended to the Father. Maybe he's not coming back at all. Maybe the second coming stuff is all nonsense. To which the author of 2 Peter writes, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The Lord is patient. Right now, in the time between the advents, between the Lord's first coming as a baby and his second coming as judge, is a time that is rich with divine patience. Opportunities to repent and, and believe are everywhere. Opportunities to love and serve are everywhere. Opportunities to begin the healing process are everywhere. Today, after church, you can pick up the phone and call that family member and you can say you're sorry and that you want to be reconciled with her. Today, that can happen. Today, after the service, you can call the therapist or the counselor or the friend or the family member and say, help me, I'm stuck. I can't seem to get this monkey off my back. These drugs are ruining my life. My temper is destroying my marriage. I need help. And if you don't do anything like that today, here's more good news. There's tomorrow. And most likely there's the day after that and the day after that. Again, right now we live, again, between the advents and in this time period we're so blessed because God's patience is overflowing. I think we should all feel like Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas morning, still in his night clothes, with all the church bells ringing in London, 
and the kid with the Cockney accent strolling by on the, wind, on the street below. Today, right now, you can experience new life, fresh start, and it's wonderful. But, and this is the warning that I, I promised I'd deliver, and it's really not my warning, it's, it's from this, from the Holy Scripture. There will come a time when it's too late. There, there will come a time when it's too late, and it may be tomorrow, or it may be the day after that. It may be 60 years from now. It may happen on the day when our Lord returns to judge the living and the dead, or it may happen on the day when your earthly life ends and the Lord comes specifically for you. The point, once more, is this. The day is coming when it will be too late. In Second Peter, it says that this day will come, and I quote, like a thief in the night. So be ready, stay alert, keep awake. Those are our watchwords for Advent. Take full advantage of the abundant mercy that even now is being extended to you. Repent, believe, forgive, love, serve, live by the ethic of the kingdom of God, live a life of holiness and godliness. You live your life in such a way that you won't be afraid of any kind of future unveiling of things. And then when the Lord returns as judge, when the Lord returns to usher in the eternal kingdom of God where righteousness is at home, you will be found ready.